Welcome back to Law News Network. I'm Heather Hansen, and I am here with a former prosecutor, current trial attorney, Matthew Adam Gray. Welcome, Matthew. There's so much to talk about here, and let's start with the Segura case because there's so many legal issues here that the lawyers have been fighting about. Absolutely. Let's start with the DNA evidence that we've heard so such very exciting evidence that we've Absolutely. heard so much right? this morning. Numbing, yes. Tell us a little bit about what you thought of the approach of the defense attorney in cross-examining her about this DNA evidence. I mean, I think right out of the gate, he could have just said, let's establish right out. There was no evidence whatsoever, physical DNA linking my client to the scene of this crime, yes or no. Just start with that. And then go into the mind-numbing necessity that he <laughs> needed to do, probably in order to establish later on for his expert to speak to the DNA. But the jury, I mean, at this point, is probably falling asleep. Well, I want to kind of unpack some of that because okay. I agree with you. If you start with that point and then kind of throw it in there every once in a while to reiterate it. It could be helpful if you've got a jury falling asleep. But you mentioned that it's necessary for his expert. Tell us why. Sure. I mean, I think that because the judge ruled that the CODIS hit was not admissible because it's hearsay, but then kind of alluded to later on he was going to allow his own expert to address that. I believe it was uh, the Quinones hit, the Avia Quinones of this person that is surprisingly linked to this Mexican drug cartel right. and the woman that's been murdered also happens to be a drug runner. So I think later on he's really going to give them a lot of leeway to explore that on their own case. So there's probably pieces of that DNA evidence that at this point is mind-numbing and boring, but maybe essential him for a link later on to get in front of the jury. And I think you're right about that, Matthew, because they're talking about, just now they were talking about, is this part of the argument for Wednesday? Mm -hmm. So the plan right now, as far as we know it, is the prosecution expects to rest right around Wednesday. Okay. And then there's going to be a host of arguments on, one of the things will be exactly what you just brought up. How much can they get into, and when you reference the CODIS, that's that database Correct. of DNA evidence that thus far has been precluded to be specifically spoken about. But the judge has sort of said that maybe in the defense case, they will be able to make that connection to this Avila Quinones, right. who was apparently a major drug cartel participant. Unbelievable. So that's going to be really interesting argument and evidence if it gets in. The other argument that's supposed to be had on Wednesday has to do with this apparent confessor who made a confession to the crime and now has said today that he plans to plead the fifth. Correct. Now, we talk about hearsay a lot here on Law News, but if he decides to plead the fifth, if Santos, who's the person who had confessed to this crime, plans to plead the fifth, is there a way for the defense attorneys to still get in that testimony, do you see? Or is it really going to be precluded because he's just not going to say it? Well, I mean, the judge has kind of taken a look at that already and said that he's going to allow him and some of that testimony to be admissible. I mean, if he's going to get up there and plead the fifth, there are restrictions on putting a witness on for the sole purpose of impeaching them. Mm -hmm. But I do think if this is someone who has confessed to a crime for which the defendant who is seated there's life is on the line, I think the judge is going to give them a lot of leeway. At the very least, he'll allow them to impeach. I understand, sir, that you're pleading the fifth now, but isn't it true that you admitted to murdering the person that this person's on trial for? Right. And then even though we always tell juries the questions aren't evidence, it's only the answers oh, yeah. that are That's evidence, right. those questions are are going to be if, if given and if asked in front of the jury they will definitely stick in the jury's minds as some um, it's it will end up being evidence even if the judge tells True. them that it isn't I mean jurors that I speak to my friends whenever they're on jury duty they're like they hear the close of the the state then they hear the close of the defense they're like he did he did it I mean they hang on the on the attorney's words I mean they're not supposed to but really they do believe a lot of what they come and a lot of successful trial practices building credibility with the jury and speaking to them and giving them goosebumps. I mean, some of these, you know, the prosecution's case here is real slow and steady. The defendant stands up. It's like, this is what I'm going to tell you this. They're paying attention. By the time the prosecution was done, I don't know, maybe they're snoozing. It's time for a cup of coffee. But when the defense got out of there, right out of the gate, he was speaking to them. He spoke about his soul, his heart. Like he's really oh, yeah. trying to compel them and convince them that his client didn't commit this heinous, heinous crime. And absolutely. And one of the things you pointed out before we came live on air about the openings is that it sort of gave us a tip as to what we might expect in the defense case. What did you say you're expecting? I mean, based on what he said, I don't know how else he can get all that information from the jury unless his client is willing to testify. And it's a tricky strategy, but I think what they must have, must have been thinking, rather than play games with reasonable doubt and that the burden's on the state and that they haven't placed any physical evidence at the scene, 
is that you have a jury that's looking at the death of three toddlers and a woman. A woman who fought so hard that she broke her fingernails and fractured her hand and watched her children murdered in front of her. Right. So they're like, we can't have any open questions, so we need to explain to this jury, why is he calling her and lying about it? Why does he have a backup cell phone? Why is he in the area, the cell sites, right. at or about the time of the murder? And so the they're gonna put him on the stand to explain. And he's going to have to fall on the sword, as you said, about the fact that he's a player. Right, and that's, <laughs> that's how they're doing it. I mean, they got right out in front of it. And that's sometimes you see that's how they do it. They're like, listen, he's a creep. He right. doesn't pay a child support. He cheats on every woman that he's ever been with, but he's not a murderer. Right. And he's a creep who knows how to get out of paying child support without having to kill someone. I like that. And exactly. I agree. He, yeah. He's, he, I, I think that it's a, a very effective way to come at a case like this one, which, as you said, I mean, you know, I know from our viewers that anytime children are involved, it's extremely emotional. Wrenching. I and mean, the facts of this case, one of the children was held by the neck and shot in front of I mean, she died a slow death. It's the it's one of the most tragic cases I've heard about. Absolutely, and 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 it looks like it's going to go relatively quickly. Even though this morning, as you said, it seems oh, to be sort of mind numbing. Real fest, but yes. Well, one of the things when you have to do this type of testimony, do you ever turn off the lights? <laughs> I mean, it is just not a good <laughs> it idea. It is. It's like to a turn off the lights. Sometimes they really do fall asleep. I mean, you look over and they are snoozing. So it's like some of this evidence you got to move more quickly through. I really do think. I mean, I know that they're doing the case. It's easy to Monday morning quarterback from here, of course. Of but course. they got to move it a little bit. I mean, it's yeah. taken a long time with this particular witness who, I mean, her intonation, everything about her is a real snooze, huh? Yeah, you know, it's definitely, <laughs> it is definitely one of the witnesses that is probably most important and yet at the same time difficult to make sure that you move quickly, get the points that you want and get out of there. Absolutely. Now in Gaspar, we're waiting because we're anticipating closings to happen relatively soon. Right. But let's talk about what happened very quickly when we went to Gaspar here. Mr. Gaspar stood up then sat back down, but what he was telling the judge was that he did not intend to testify on his own behalf. What do you think about that decision? I think it's a good play. I mean, it could only hurt him. At this point, the case, the state's case is a little weak. And mm -hmm. so for him to get on the stand and subject himself to an experienced cross from a prosecutor could really probably only hurt him. I agree. I, I think that this case, as it has gone in, you know, the idea of him being reckless when he was traveling only, at most only a few miles above right. the speed limit is a little bit of a stretch. And then the impairment evidence came through uh, Sergeant Robert Gable, who I think that many people felt as though some of his, some of his testimony was a stretch. And we're going to throw to some clips of that in just a minute but I wanted to talk to you about the methadone aspect of this case sure. because we see this opioid epidemic across the United States I feel like every day in the newspapers there's a different article about how are we going to deal with this epidemic and how it's affecting our children and, and heroin and people in jail and one of the ways that's proven to help is the use of methadone Absolutely. and yet cases like this sort of put methadone in a bad light so the idea that in some states you are not automatically impaired as soon as you take methadone sort of lends itself to the type of testimony we needed to hear here, correct? Correct. I mean, they have, again, like you said, I mean, this is the heartland. It's one of the regions of this country that's been hardest hit that's by right. this opioid um, epidemic. It's epidemic. It's an epidemic. Thank yeah, you, epidemic. Really and it's like they're just trying to have somebody who took prescribed medication right. given by a doctor. They have the doctors testifying. We gave it to him. Yep. And then he gets in his car and he drives. If there was a, a sheet that he was handed or some type of instruction he was given that said, do not get in your vehicle, then maybe you'd have a case there. But he wasn't on notice. He's taking a doctor's medication. You have jurors in that region that, I mean, they could go either way. They could be tired of this. They could be tired of their tax dollars being spent on ER mm -hmm. services and supportive services for people with addiction, or their hearts might go out to him. I mean, you might have people whose children are addicted to drugs who can't take methadone or refuse or unwilling to do that and so then their hearts might go out to them that way so it could go either way well and so many people start with these addictions by taking prescribed pain pills to your point and one of the things that you raised again when we were about to mic you up is the fact that the doctor if, if you're going to believe that this was beyond negligence then the doctor should be sitting there next to him Absolutely. and he's not because you know truth be told this is what's happening in this clinic and clinics across the United States day in and day out what I want to do now is throw to a clip of the doctor and we'll listen to a little bit of Dr. Richard DeFranco's testimony and then Matthew and I will be back to discuss it. So right now I'd like to go to clips 36 and 37 together and then we'll be back to discuss. We will take you live to the courtroom the minute that it's live. Methadone management typically is a liquid oral administration of a dose that's drank or drunk. Yes, in Ohio, according to state law, we use 
liquid methadone in Ohio. In, in some other states, they use liquid or tablets. But, so this is a liquid. In, uh, <clears throat> if a patient were to drink his, his dose of methadone, he may have a, uh, a peak blood concentration about one to two hours later. Is that the kind of thing you're asking? Yes. Okay. Um, but upon consuming the dose, how quickly does the body begin the graph of absorption where it's going to climb towards that peak? How, how fast does the ingested methadone begin to be processed by the body? Well, I think that it, it begins to be processed immediately. It's going to start to diffuse through the stomach and small intestine into the bloodstream, but that process takes time. So um, I would say it would, I mean, all I really know is that the peak is around one to two hours. And I'm not sure how fast or how high the slope is. I'm sure that's been studied. Okay. Um, but the point I'm trying to make here is that from the moment of ingestion, that process of absorption begins. Yes. And uh, I think I have an exhibit on that subject. an article where they took uh, <clears throat> excuse me, five patients who uh, were on methadone, uh, gave them their dose of between 100 and 120 milligrams of methadone, and then measured their plasma levels at 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and 24 hours, and then tried to determine how quickly the methadone plasma level went up after their dose. Does it basically agree with the statement you just made that peak absorption occurs one to two hours after ingestion? Well, the study is only looking at five individuals, but according to this, it seems that the peak is a little later, maybe three or four hours. Okay. You agree that the graph shows the blood plasma level begin to rise at the zero, the vertical left line, so that's the point of ingestion. So it becomes detectable in the blood plasma immediately or shortly after ingestion? Well, actually, in this study, these patients were on methadone already. So at time zero, uh, their blood level was uh, pretty significant. OK, but it still demonstrates a rise in the graph. Uh, not in all cases. For example, subject, uh, the first subject listed in one hour his uh, blood concentration went from 0.73 to 0.70. So that one fell. The next, uh, the next two went up, the fourth one fell, and the fifth one went up. So, okay. so that's, and that also speaks to the variability of physiology that you talked about a few minutes ago. Right. Okay. Um, methadone hydrochloride is the generic or the actual drug name that can then be branded under various other manufacturers' specific labeling, correct? Yes. Okay. So um, in the methadone clinic setting, when we talk about methadone, we're talking about the drug of methadone hydrochloride, regardless of the branding. Yes. And you said that Ohio, in the clinical setting, is a liquid administration state. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the clinic is open seven days a week. It was when I was uh, there, yes. Okay. So, for everyone's understanding, then, if you're in the program, um, in this program, are right, you required then to attend daily to receive your prescribed dose? Until uh, you earn take-home doses, yes. And how does that come about? Well, if we feel it's safe to give people take-home doses after a certain number of months, according to the state and federal regulations, we can allow them to take uh, anywhere from one day a week to six days a week, or even uh, 13 days every two weeks home. Yeah. Um, 
May I approach it? Yes. I want to show you several photographs. They're 1443, 1444, 1445, and 1446. Tell me if you recognize what's depicted in each of those. These all seem to be uh, photographs of a bottle of methadone hydrochloride, uh, similar to the ones that we uh, sometimes use at uh, the clinic. Okay. And we've all received prescriptions where you get the box and there's that folded up piece of onion skin paper with all that tiny print that's tightly bundled and attached to the box. Is one of those on that big bottle there? Yes, it is. And in, in medicine or pharmacology, that's called the package insert, correct? Yes. What's described in the package insert? Well, the characteristics of the drugs, the uh, side effects, the clinical uses, uh, some of the pharmacology. There's quite a bit in there. Yeah. Okay. Um, the intended um, therapeutic effect would be one topic, correct? Yes. In medicine or pharmacology, when we talk about a contraindication, are you familiar with that term? Yes, I am. Define it, please. What is a contraindication? A contraindication may be a characteristic of the patient that would um, make whatever particular medication you're thinking of using uh, have some deleterious effect. Uh, we some, there sometimes may be medications we use that could be harmful, but we have to make judgments about risk and benefits. So if a medication for example, you know, if someone had a cancerous tumor, we might give them chemotherapy that would make them quite sick. Uh, however, our hope would be that the beneficial effect of helping their tumor regress would be greater than any harmful effects. So a contraindication, you know, there's, there's relative contraindications, which means that, you know, so Matthew, there is the treating physician talking about why he prescribes this medication and taking into consideration the contraindications for uh, prescribing this medication. How do you think that plays with the jury? I mean, this, this witness was called during the prosecutor's case, right. and yet it seems to me that it's a, really a defense witness. Absolutely. I mean, it is a little bit of a misstep, but they did probably have to put him in front of the jury. But if he were to come out, again, like I said earlier, if he were to come out and say he absolutely should not have been driving, then that's a slam dunk. Absolutely. But he's sitting up there and basically saying that he could be driving. So how is it reckless if the doctor who gave you the medication, who isn't on trial for the crime that you're charged with, but administered the very medication that led to the death of this officer? officer, it doesn't add up. And there's so many things that I say to myself, well, if if it had been Gaspar's first time getting the methadone, right. then you might think, well, he's impaired and no one knows it because he hasn't had time to actually see. But he'd been taking the methadone regularly, I think daily, with this particular doctor. You know, there's so many ways in which the state seems to have stretched this case a little bit. Do you think that that's because it was this beloved state trooper who was the victim? Sure. I mean, there's a lot of broken hearts. Uh, the defense touched on that in their opening that it was capped by the troopers, that it wasn't farmed out to some kind of local PD or or something closer, one of, it was right on the border, so you could have gotten someone from another jurisdiction who wasn't so familiar with the deceased to kind of run the investigation. So sure, I mean, I think it influenced it. Yeah, and any time, I mean, we see this both, it, it kind of cuts both ways. When a police officer is involved in it, whether it's a police officer who is killed or mm -hmm. a police officer that does the killing, you know, more and more we're seeing in, in the United States a push towards having some independence in the investigation right. to make sure that there is no bias either way. This is a case that's a bit unusual because it's the police officer who ended up, the trooper who ended up being killed, and yet you can see why there would be some bias. And in fact, a lot of the witnesses were actually in tears as they testified about sure. uh, Trooper Velez. Do you think that the jury, being from that community, 
will have a natural inclination to want to punish the person who killed one of their state troopers. I mean, it's possible. I think that's why I think it's highly possible. I think that's why the defense right out of the gate said this is a tragedy. Yes. They acknowledged that. They owned it. It was one of the first things they said. This is an absolute tragedy. So they get out in front of it and then they say, but it's an accident. And I bet you during jury selection, there were a lot of questions about people that had been involved in rear and collisions. It's a real common accident. And if some of those people were like, well, gosh, I rear-ended somebody, I wasn't paying attention. I looked to the left, I looked to the right. right. But it doesn't mean that you were committed reckless Recklessness is the definition of that charge for the aggravated vehicular homicide. Mm -hmm. So That's willful right. and wanton disregard for the safety and health. I mean, it's this very serious definition. Somebody driving like a dip isn't necessarily going to rise <laughs> to the level of recklessness. So well, and that's and that's such an important distinction to make. And we talk about it so much here at Law News Network. But there's a big difference between negligence, sure. which is to not act with due care, and recklessness, which, as you pointed out, is more than just driving like a dip. Of course. And that's absolutely a valid point that I. I think the defense attorney will likely make in his closing. Over and over. I have been very impressed by him and his ability to take some of these, not just complicated issues, but also boring issues, and make them very simple for the jury. The The whole issue about driving with a uh, suspended license has become such a big part of this case, right. and yet it seems so minor, but it actually is an enhancer for the crime. So if he is sure. found guilty of the manslaughter charge, he actually could get a bigger sentence if he's found to have been driving with a suspended license. Isn't that right? Correct. I do think, though, that when they made the charging decisions, they overcharged. And then the defense took that and ran with it and yes, said, right. this is this is evidence that they're trying to punish this guy. The, D the DWLS that he was driving on from Ohio, they have a reasonable explanation for why it is that he thought his license had been restored That's and right. that he got a license and then they went back and suspended it. It just kind of speaks to the fact that they're trying to punish someone for this crime because they feel bad because someone died on yes. their end of it, on their side. And I'll tell you, they're outmatched. I mean, that prosecutor was a real snooze in her open. Right. And then the defense, like you said, he's an impressive guy. He stood up, hit every single point, kept them riveted, kept them interested, kept it simple. I That's mean, right. you know, parts of this case are a little confusing, but he kept it simple. Without a doubt, the bureaucracy of the DMV, right, I mean, right. we've all lived through it, but right. to hear these people testifying, it definitely could become, as you said, a snooze. And yet he really got in and just hit the points and hit them hard. He was great. He really I'm was. eager to see him give his close. Just as we saw in the Segura case, we've seen two really good defense attorneys. And the prosecutors have been good, you know, some, some sure. better than others. But I think that um, I am eager to hear how the defense attorney in the Gaspar case really just tries to circle everything up and kind of drive home the points that you've made right. that this was a tragedy but not the result of any sort of recklessness or impairment. Right. Let's talk a little bit about the impairment piece because we heard and I'm going to play some clips for you of Sergeant Robert Gable is the police officer who actually conducted the field sobriety test and there's um, some issue here even with potential bias because it seems as though there's some questions as to whether Gasper passed the test right. and yet the sergeant still found him to be impaired. Right. So let's watch clip number 44 and then I'll come back and talk to Matthew. Remember, as soon as we go live in either Segura or Gaspar, we'll take you there. But in the meantime, let's watch clip number 44. The task again, uh, it's a it's never ending process. And I had been in the office for a very short time uh, when I overheard some radio traffic. So. Um, as I'm in the office, I have a portable radio on my side and I can hear uh, what's going on as far as what our officers are doing and what our dispatch is sending them to or receiving from the officers. Um, so I'm monitoring that radio traffic. I heard uh, over the radio car 3215, uh, which is unusual, um, but it's not unheard of. Um, within the State Highway Patrol, there's another, there's another couple of branches um, that use our radio system as well. And when they want to talk to a trooper that they see out on the road, they call them by their car number because they don't know who's driving the car. Um, so that came over the radio a couple of times, car 3215, car 3215. Um, I, I believe I radioed to, to say um, 511, which is uh, Kenny's unit number. Uh, 511, someone's trying to raise you on the radio. Um, at some point, someone came over the radio and said that a trooper had been hit. Um, so I went to dispatch, uh, figured out where Kenny had been working. Uh, that's when I learned he was out on, on 90 West in, in the area of mile post 164. Um, so I headed toward the scene. Um, 
along with Trooper McGill, who happened to be on post uh, from, uh, he's one of our canine handlers. Uh, so he happened to be on post at the same time. He also. So there's Sergeant Robert Gable talking about Kenny. Matthew, the fact that he refers to uh, Trooper Velez as Kenny, does that in and of itself make the jury more likely to sort of feel personally towards the state trooper? Sure. I mean, I think that's a good catch. I mean, he did call him by his first name, and I think the defense will speak about that in their close. I think the jury hearts are going to go out to them. I think it could potentially influence his ability to be fair and impartial if he's doing these field sobriety exercises for someone that he's so close to. And one of the things that I know we both try cases and one of the things that sort of gets put by the wayside is the psychology of the players, the psychology of the jury. And so to your point, you know, when you hear someone referred to as Kenny as opposed to Sergeant v uh, Trooper Velez, it does make a difference. The other part of psychology that I want to talk to you about is the fact that in this next clip, Sergeant Gable is told that uh, Gaspar may be under the influence of something. So let's listen to that clip and then talk about how that could actually influence his investigation going forward. So this is clip number 46. In uniform supervisors on scene. Why is the attorney on the scene? That's our procedure, our protocol, is that uh, when someone of higher rank arrives on scene, the scene is relinquished to them unless they designate someone else. So what occurs next? Um, so I uh, didn't have any direct responsibilities at that moment. We were kind of waiting on resources. Um, so I took a, a moment uh, just to kind of step back from the scene and, uh, and just process for a minute uh, mentally. Um, put that back in a box and, and went back to work. What was the next thing you did when you went back to work? Um, I reapproached um, Staff Lieutenant Shepard and Lieutenant Hughes, um, inquired if uh, it would be okay if I went over and spoke with uh, the driver. Um, they said that uh, they were they were they had received instruction, I don't know from who, to um, just stand by on that is what they, they said, um, just waiting for uh, an investigator to come. Um, there was some discussion about whether uh, an allegation of um, being on something uh, would potentially um, prevent or inhibit the interview um, of the driver. And what was done next, sir? Um, we, were, we were waiting. Uh, so reconstruction, uh, crash reconstruction unit, they, they began arriving on scene. Um, different investigators uh, from the local uh, Cleveland district began arriving on scene. Um, they were directed to witnesses and began taking statements. Um, some of the investigators are evidence technicians, so uh, they began you know, their work. Uh, so there was a lot of scene work going on uh, during that time as we waited. Um, I was told we were waiting on Sergeant Blake, uh, who was the uh, the sergeant uh, in charge of the Office of Criminal Investigation for the Cleveland District um, under the uh, uh, under Lieutenant Huggins would be above him. But and what are you doing during this time period? Um, just just asking what needs to be done and doing what I'm told, uh, following orders. Um, so there's there's not a lot for me to do. Um, so periodically checking in on on. Uh, Troopers on scene. Um, during that time, I called um, each of the other sergeants and let them know what was going on. Um, a couple of them had already heard and, and had gone to the hospital. Um, talked to my secretary on the phone. Um, yeah. What's the next step in terms of your portion of this investigation? Um, Sergeant Blake arrived on scene. Um, I met him uh, when I heard him signal or say over the radio that he was arriving on scene. Uh, so I knew that he was on scene. I, I met him um, at the edge of the scene and uh, he asked me uh, what, what needed to be done. Uh, I told him that um, my understanding was that we were waiting on him to uh, do an interview. Um, if I back up just a minute, uh, there had been a conversation with uh, Staff Lieutenant Shepard, Staff Lieut or Lieutenant, now Staff Lieutenant Hughes. Um, there had been a conversation about um, me 
observing um, the interview of the driver in this case. Um, the purpose of observe, my desire in observing him was to determine whether there was reason to go any further uh, with field sobriety tests. What or, do you mean you need to determine there was reason to go any further with sobriety testing? Um, up to this point, we had a, a traffic crash um, and we had someone who I didn't know. Uh, it would have been relayed to me, uh, so I had information that I didn't know the source of, that someone said, um, they think he's on something. Um, so for me, that, that's not enough to just have somebody do field sobriety tests, and there needs to be more to that. Um, and so my desire was to interact with him uh, in some way so that I could either dispel that or confirm that there was reasonable suspicion uh, to continue with some sort of a impaired driving investigation. Excuse me, Judge, wait a Welcome back to Law News Network. I'm Heather Hansen here with Matthew Adam Gray. And that clip was interesting. It's sort of setting us up for the field sobriety test, which we're going to see in just a minute, Matthew. But it's talking, he's talking about putting his emotions in a box, sort of, and um, approaching the witness after seeing one of his friends killed. Is that even possible? You know, we want to, ex we want to expect that type of behavior from our police officers. And yet, they're humans, right? Right. I mean, absolutely. And of course, as I said earlier, the defense will pounce on that. I mean, you have someone who's on the stand who's to be supposed to be conducting an impartial investigation who is visibly moved that's right a year later he's still moved by the fact that his friend was killed and yet he's the person who's supposed to be administering these tests which should be conducted by someone who is not being influenced in any way by their personal feelings right and then the fact that he talks about that that he was told that maybe Gaspar was on something sort of sets you up to the expectation again that in fact Gaspar could be on something and so in stepping in to do the field sobriety test to have that expectation sometimes your expectations then create reality absolutely so let's look at the next clips which actually talk about, Sergeant talks about his field sobriety test and what he found, and then Matthew and I will be back to discuss. And so what happened next, Lieutenant? Uh, Sergeant Blake opened uh, the uh, right rear. So what happened next, Lieutenant? Uh, Sergeant Blake opened uh, the uh, right rear passenger door of an unmarked highway patrol vehicle where um, the driver was seated. Um, At that point in time, were you able to get a good view of the driver? Yes, do I was. See, do you see that person in the courtroom today? I do. Can you please identify them and describe them for the record? Stipulate to identify your own. Record will reflect identification of the defendant by this witness. Thank you, Your Honor. At that point in time, where you see the defendant seated in the unmarked trooper vehicle, what happened next? So Sergeant Blake is standing uh, as though you were to open the door, he was in the doorway, and I was on the other side of the door uh, looking in at uh, Mr. Gaspar, the defendant in the case. Um, I noticed right away uh, that his eyes were very wide open, and uh, he has very blue eyes, so it's very easy to see his pupils. Uh, his pupils did appear uh, constricted to me. Um, it's also a bright sunny day, uh, which causes pupillary constriction. Um, so I was certainly aware of that and looking at that, but uh, they, they certainly looked very constricted uh, and very wide open as uh, Sergeant Blake explained to him that our plan was to ask him for a voluntary sample. And um, Mr. Gaspar was confused by that uh, in, in that uh, we had to explain several times. Um, so I kind of jumped in on Sergeant Blake and, and because I kind of sensed that Mr. Gaspar was becoming agitated. Um, and in, in drug recognition expert school, um, we spend time making sure the students understand that if you're, if you're trying to have someone do a drug recognition expert evaluation, which is about 45 minutes to an hour and 15 minutes of time, uh, we are asking someone for, um, to take their temperature, their pulse rate, their blood pressure, um, you're going to look in their nose and in their mouth. Um, you're going to look at their pupils in three different phases of light uh, in a darkened room. Uh, the last thing you want to do is go into uh, like, a, like a really hard uh, cop mode and start, you know, agitating people. Um, so I wanted to just bring the mood down just a minute and, you know, let's slow down. Uh, let's, let's just talk about what we're doing here. Um, so 
I told Mr. Gaspar, you know, it really, it's just, it's our policy, it's part of our procedure to ask someone to do that. Um, you're not required to do it, um, but we're just asking if, if you would be willing to give a sample. Um, he said he didn't understand why we would want to do that. Again, I said, you know, it's, it's just part of our procedure. It's, it's what we do. It's, you know, it's a pretty serious crash. I'm sure you understand that it's pretty serious here. Um, so it's a checkbox on a checklist that we have to, to say this is, this is something that we, we want to do is identify whether or not there are drugs or alcohol in, in a person's system uh, for all drivers involved in fatalities. Um, he still, you know, needed that explained again. So we went through it again. Um, and I told him, you know, again, you're not required to do it, but are you willing to do that? Um, at that point, he said, I really think I need to speak to a lawyer before I say or do anything else. Um, so that's fine. One moment, please. Ladies and gentlemen, you understand all of us have a constitutional right not to incriminate ourselves or talk with the police. And so uh, the fact that Mr. Gaspar did or didn't do that at any point, uh, it's his right, and you may not consider it for any purpose whatsoever. Okay? He was talking low. Um, he was talking very slowly. Uh, so, you know, as he's answering his things uh, and asking questions, uh, up to that point, he, he's just speaking slowly uh, with a low, kind of a raspy voice. Um, and again, his eyes just remained wide open during the conversation. Um, Did those observations have any significance to you? Yes. What was the significance of those observations? So constricted pupils, um, there's a lot of reasons for them, but in a drug symptomology matrix, uh, they fall into one category, and that category is narcotic analgesics. Um, and it's kind of a telltale thing. There's a lot of drugs in the narcotic analgesic category, including heroin, uh, fentanyl, carfentanil, uh, as long with a lot of prescription medications. Uh, methadone is one of those, Oxycontin, Percocet. So there's a lot of opiate-related or opioid drugs that fit into the narcotic analgesic category. All of those drugs um, constrict pupils. They also uh, produce withdrawal, and they also stave off withdrawal. Um, so seeing the very constricted pupils, um, hearing a low raspy voice, which also is one of the general indicators for the narcotic analgesic category, um, but then seeing wide open eyes um, doesn't fit with that necessarily. And it, it was certainly something um, of, of note, something of interest, something that I can't forget. Um, so there was, there was a lot going on with him, um, and because of the repeated uh, explanation over uh, what I believe to be something pretty simple. You know, we, we basically are asking you to, to give a sample um, and then had to keep repeating that we're asking you to give a sample. Um, he seemed confused. He seemed to be having trouble processing the information that we were giving. Um, so I felt there was enough there to, uh, <coughs> to have him do some, some field sobriety tests. And what do you do next at this point? Um, I have him get out of the vehicle. Uh, well, he was still seated in the vehicle when I explained to him um, that, I, that I would be um, having him do a couple field sobriety tests just to make sure that um, drugs or alcohol did not play a part in what had occurred that day. Um, I did tell him that uh, news cameras were, were being set up on uh, the Alger Road overpass, was just to our east. Uh, I told uh, Mr. Gaspar that um, I was interested in, in moving him um, away from those cameras uh, to put him at the opposite end of the scene. Uh, there was a van parked down there. I said, we can, we can take you to the other side of that van. Uh, that way you're not on video uh, doing field sobriety tests. Um, when so there's Sergeant Robert Gable talking some more, Matthew, about the field sobriety test and sort of setting up, you know, first he pulls him over and, and Gaspar's in the car. And some of the things that he's giving as evidence of some sort of an impairment, a little weak to me. What do you think? I agree. I mean, what he's basically describing is someone who's just taken a dose of methadone, a prescribed dose of methadone. People that are abusing heroin, we've all seen them on the subway, the street, television, they're nodding out, they're incoherent, they're stumbling. That's not what he's describing. He's someone who just struck someone on the side of the road oh, whose right. eyes, are, her eyes are wide. Well, of course they are. 
Yeah, I mean, that's another very important point, and a point the defense attorney has made again and again, is that if you just struck a state trooper on the side of the road, you're going to be in shock. I don't think that there's anyone who could, unless they were a psychopath, who could go through that type of experience and not be in shock. Absolutely. And, and so sort of, you know, setting the stage for this to be a situation where he was impaired may have been the result of having just seen one of his own be, be killed as a result of what could have been just an accident. Right. I mean, they want to lay blame on someone because it's a, it's a true tragedy. But, you know, drug rec recognition, excuse me, experts are not infallible. I mean, it's not an exact science. Right. When you've got a breathalyzer and alcohol, that's an exact science. That's right. But DREs are trying to look for cues and signs to try to determine if someone's impaired. And my understanding is that many of the things that you need for a divided attention exercise like driving, he was able to do. Get out of the car. Walk. Turn right. his head, touch his nose. Those are the things that you would need to drive a car. So if he's able to do that, how do they then argue that he's impaired? And let's go to the next set of clips. Um, we're going to do actually 49 through 51, and then we'll come back and discuss them and discuss the actual field sobriety test. When you may not really be impaired. Um, so I don't want it to appear just because you're doing tests that you're impaired if you end up not being. Um, he was confused by that again, and, and he asked, uh, you know, I don't understand why you would want to m take me away from the cameras. And I said, you know, look, I understand, um, you know, in policing, um, how video can sometimes not really tell the true story, and someone can uh, make up their mind just watching a video without having the background or the audio to go with it. And, so what I don't want is for someone to be watching you on live news and say, I know that guy, he's impaired. You know, the cops have him doing tests, he's impaired. Um, when that may not be the end result of the test. And uh, so I just want to protect you from that. Um, he thought about it for a minute. Um, and then he responded to me that he felt like maybe he should do it in front of all the news cameras. And so, so, uh, okay, um, you know, that's, that's, if that's what you want to do. And then he said uh, he felt like he should have all those cameras to show that he wasn't impaired. He said, well, you know, sir, I, you're going to be on dash camera. Uh, you're going to be on camera. Um, certainly, I'm not taking you somewhere where I'm not going to have you on camera. You'll be on camera the whole time, but I'll be audio recording it as well. So not only will, you, will it be video, but you'll be able to hear. Uh, anyone watching it later could hear it. Um, he said, no, I think I should have, I think I should be on as many cameras as possible. I said, that's fine. Um, go ahead and step out. I'll have you do a couple things for me. Is that this point in time that you begin to administer standardized bill sobriety testing? Um, I didn't have my belt microphone on me. Uh, I was still in the charger. I would ask him uh, if he was uh, currently experiencing back pain. He said that no, he was not in pain. Uh, I asked him if he would have any problem if he felt like that would um, give him problems in walking, and he said he didn't think so, that he would be fine. Now, Lieutenant Gable, at this point in time, why are you asking all these questions? Um, that's part of standardized field sobriety testing, asking someone if uh, they have problems with their uh, neck, back, legs, uh, balance issues. Um, also, I'm going to be looking at his eyes, uh, so asking if he has any eye defects or problems with his eyes. And what happened? Um, I could tell that he wanted to say something, um, uh, and, and then he, he said he wanted to say something. I said, well, you know, it's, if you want to say something, I'm, I'm not going to keep you from talking, but I'm not asking you. And he said, uh, well, I'm on a methadone maintenance program, and I just don't know how that's going to look in the test. And I said, I, I don't know how that's going to look for you either. I, I really can't advise you, uh, you know, what that's going to do to you or what that's looking like for you right now. And uh, I responded in that way because I really didn't know when he had taken his last dose. Um, I didn't know if he had had any food to go with it. Um, I assumed it was oral methadone. Um, I didn't know when his last dose prior to that was. Uh, there were a lot of factors that I didn't know to really tell him that's you're going to be messed up. Um, so I, I couldn't I couldn't really tell him. I, I, so I very honestly told him, I don't know how that's affecting you right now. I don't know that's. Lieutenant Gable, can you please walk us through the instructions you typically give for the walk and turn test? So, for the walk and turn test, um, typically uh, the person performing the test should be to my left. Uh, 
So that's as though um, the person doing the test is over here. Um, I would tell the person to put their left foot on a, on a line, put their right foot directly in front of the line, heel to toe stop. <clears throat> and so I demonstrate for them exactly what I want them to do on the line. And I would wait for them to do that. And I would tell them to put their hands out against their sides and keep their hands against their sides throughout the remainder of the instruction. I make sure that they understand that they're not to move from that position. So while I explain this test, I really do need them to stand in this, what's considered the instruction position. And the reason why it's important they not move is there's two clues that I'm looking for during this portion of the test. I'm looking for them to move their feet apart. So their feet apart, so if you see from this angle, it's going to move the feet apart so they lose balance and have to adjust moving their feet apart. I'm also looking for them to potentially start the test before the instructions are completed. Those are the two things I'm looking for during just the instruction phase of the test. But I put them into the instruction position, I make sure that they understand they're not to move, and then once they understand, I explain to them, when I tell you to start this test, I want you to take nine heel to toe steps on the line, do a turn exactly the way that I instruct you, and then take nine heel to toe steps back on the line. And then I demonstrate for them. It should look and sound very similar to this. Your first step is going to be with your left foot coming around. Step number one, two, three, and continuing. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. At the end of your ninth step, you need to leave your front foot on the ground. Bring your other foot around and use that foot to take a series of small steps to turn yourself around. Once you're facing back where you began, it should be nine toe to toe steps on the line. And then there's four instructions given at the end. It's very important that once you start taking your steps, you don't stop walking at any time. Make sure you keep your hands right against your sides throughout the test. Make sure you say your steps out loud. And make sure you keep your eyes pointed down toward your feet throughout the test. I ask them if they have any questions about the test. And once they confirm that they don't have any questions, then I tell them to go ahead and begin the test. Thank you. So Matthew, there he's actually reenacting part of the field sobriety test. I get the sense that he is almost trying to convince himself that Gaspar is actually impaired. What did you think, and how do you think this will play to the to the jury? Sure. I mean, I think what's happening there, it's a little unusual. I think if you have video footage, he alluded to a dashboard cam, why not just roll tape? Right. He's obviously impaired if he's stumbling, if he can't walk straight. Instead, he's getting down and he's saying, okay, this is what it is. It's a subtle thing that you're going to have to see on the tape because this is what it would be. Right. I mean, so he's really kind of trying to think to lay the foundation for what's going to show someone who's not really having a hard time with a walk and turn. Great point. That this is why it is because you don't see it this way because you're lay people. And so let me explain it to you. The other thing that I thought was interesting is Gaspar's asking for more cameras. Sure. He's saying, not only do I want this to be by the police camera, but I want to be in front of the news cameras. Why do you think that was? It's a little unusual. I mean, it could be methadone could be influenced the way that he thinks a little bit, or he might just have a deep mistrust from of the police as being someone who is mixed up in drug addiction. We don't know what his criminal history is unless he testifies, but there might be some of that going on. He also knows that he killed a trooper. Right. I mean, he's not right. immune to that idea, so he probably wants to protect himself somewhat. What really my takeaway from this is that you have someone who's incredibly cooperative. That's right. Proving a case when someone clams up, lawyers up, and doesn't say anything, those are the hardest cases. That's it's a very good point because a lot of times people think that's what they should be doing. And you know, as you, as a lawyer, you tell people, don't talk to don't anyone. Talk to <laughs> ever. Exactly. I'm like, I'm the bad guy. You tell them, you know a lawyer, do not speak to anyone about anything, call your lawyer immediately. Right. Because most cases are proven, not most, but many cases are proven by the things that people will say to the cops. You cannot believe when you speak to them, you're like, why on earth would you have told the police that? Right. But and here, people just don't know. But here, Gaspar sort of helps himself. He you know, volunteers. He's, yeah, he's like, let's do it. I mean, uh, he could have just refused and then they would have, you know, maybe drawn blood, but I doubt a judge would have allowed that to happen and would have had to go on and get some kind of warrant or something to draw blood from him. They might have, but he could have played it differently and he didn't. So. Right. And, and, and I, think, I think to your point, I think that it probably helped him. So let's go to the next clips as we continue to walk through the field sobriety test. As you, and just as a reminder, the Segura case is on a break. They were still in the middle of the DNA evidence. The Gaspar case, they came back to the courtroom. Uh, the defendant, Mr. Gaspar, said that he was not going to testify. And then the judge took what was supposed to be a 30-minute break to go over some um, evidence and on his other dockets.
We are waiting for both cases to come back. As a programming reminder, ladies and gentlemen, any time that we're watching one trial on the main screen and you want to watch something else, just go to the upper left-hand corner of your screen. There's a drop-down and you can pick whichever trial you want to follow. The plan right now is to go with gas bar closings when they come back, but if Segura comes back first, we'll go there first. Right now, we're going to continue to play the clips of the portions of Sergeant Gable's testimony about the field sobriety test and discuss them with Matthew while we have him here. So we'll go back to that next clip. Walk us through the instructions you typically give for the one leg stand test. Sure. Uh, again, uh, as though the person were standing there at the table, I tell the person to put their feet together, hands down against their sides. And this is the instruction position for the test. So I tell them that's what I need them to do. I wait for them to get into that position before I begin the test for the instructions for the test. I tell them that uh, when I tell them to, to raise one foot into the air, either foot, hold it level or parallel with the ground, about six inches off the ground, and then I typically say, you know, it's about right up here. I tell them to keep their hands against their sides, their feet and legs uh, straight, uh, and to remain in that position while counting out loud in the following manner, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, and so on until told to stop. And then I tell them it will be 30 seconds. I ask them if they have any questions about the test. If they don't have any questions, then I tell them they can begin the test. When they begin the test, I start timing the test on my okay. <clears throat> Prior to having him do the test, did I observe him? Yes. Did you see any visible injuries to his head or face area? No. Prior to having the defendant perform the test, did you question the defendant about any particular injuries or pains to any area? Yes. Did he provide you with any responses to any issues he was having? Um, he said that uh, he had a, a bad back or a sore back or he had had back problems. I don't remember exactly what he said as far as his back went. Did you inquire of the defendant as to whether or not he was experiencing known issues at the time of the test? Yes, I did. And what was his response? He said he was not in pain. Did the defendant indicate to you any injuries to his head or leg or anything of that nature? No. After all of this is completed, what is it that you do next? As far as this defendant or yeah. in standardized field sobriety tests? Okay. Um, for, for in this case, um, I moved beyond standardized field sobriety tests um, after the vertical gaze and stagmas. Um, so, you know, beginning with horizontal gaze and stagmas, I'm looking for several things in that test. I moved into vertical gaze and stagmas. Then I moved into what's called lack of convergence. Um, so that's a test where um, I move, uh, again, the same stimulus that I used for horizontal and vertical gaze and stagmas. Um, I moved into lack of convergence, which is moving the stimulus around in a circle two times and then bringing the stimulus in toward the bridge of the person's nose and then I hold that stimulus there looking for the eyes to converge equally and remain converged. Um, there are some drug categories that uh, don't allow the eyes to fully converge and stay converged. So what I'm looking for is for the pupils, the irises, to not come all the way in and stay there. Um, in this case with Mr. Gaspar, um, as I move the stimulus in, his left eye moved back out straight rather than staying converged. I repeat the test to see that I get the same thing, and again, his left eye moved in with his right as it came in, and then his left eye moved out to the side before I removed the stimulus. As it relates to this defendant, was the performance or administration of the test that were administrated to him captured on video? Yes. If you were to see that item, would you recognize it again? If I were to see the video, the video, sure, yes. So welcome back to Law News Network. Matthew Adam Gray and I are here talking about the field sobriety test in the gas bar case as we wait for those lawyers to come back and do their closings. So Matthew, if you, you're a former prosecutor. Correct. If you're also, the, I did some public defense work as well. Wow, well, so sides you've got both things. sides, right, yeah. and you're currently trying cases. So right. if you're, let's talk first if you're the prosecutor, because we've talked so much about how we both, I think, feel the defense has a pretty strong case here. But if you're the prosecutor, you have to A, believe your case, and B, argue it to the jury. How how would you do that in this case with these closings coming up in minutes? 
I mean, basically what I think they're going to end up doing is arguing that all the other vehicles on the road were somehow able to avoid this tragic accident, and yet the person who had just popped some methadone in their mouth was unable to. Also, I guess they're going to revisit. I mean, they lost some credibility on that. We talked about earlier with that speed. I mean, that's essential to a reckless charge. So yes. I guess they'll focus on the fact that speeding, I mean, sometimes speeding is based on the circumstances. The right. speed limit's a suggestion, I guess. If it's stop and go traffic, if you're going 60, you're like, oh, that's the speed limit. That's kind of not how that works. So they would focus on that. And then I guess the portions of the field sobriety tests that were negative. I think that we're not reflecting well on whether he was impaired. The horizontal gaze nystagmus, nystagmus, they keep saying that, like very technical term. To me, I would just explain it to them as like, it's a, in a fluttering. It's, it's a flutter of the eye and someone who's loaded, their eyes flutter. Like Matthew, I just kept it kind of. Such a good point. And one of the things that I always stress to my young associates is the curse of knowledge. You know, when you know something so well, and so these police officers and the prosecutors know the nystagmus test, Which, but the jury doesn't. So you've got to say, you know, what does it it's mean? A flutter. What does it look like? Right, exactly, a flutter. It's and just, then really, I mean, that's my takeaway from it. If someone's bloated or high or intoxicated or impaired, their eyes are going to do this involuntary thing when you try to get them to go to the different areas of the eye plane. And that's such an easier way and a better way to explain it to these jurors, and it makes things so much easier to sort of wrap up at the end. Right. But I think you're 100% correct, because we saw it in their opening, that the prosecutors are going to say, everyone else was able to avoid this. Everyone else was able to do the right thing. And yet this one particular gentleman who just happened to have just taken a drug was not able to do the right thing. Right. And that may be strong enough. I mean, you know, we may see a really strong closing from the prosecutor. I'm going to take us back to the next clip on of the field sobriety test description, and then I'm going to ask you what you would do if you were the defense attorney, which I think might be a little easier for you. But right now we'll throw to the next clip. Uh, this is where I had Trooper McGill um, go and get my patrol car and pull it up. Um, I was motioning to him that I needed my belt light. Uh, this, is, this is the horizontal gaze nystagmus followed by vertical gaze nystagmus and then lack of convergence. They're all right here together. And during your administration of these tests, what, if anything, did you notice from the defendant? Uh, so throughout horizontal gaze nystagmus, there's six total clues that I'm looking for. A lack of smooth pursuit in each eye, a distinct and sustained nystagmus at maximum deviation. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, a lack of smooth pursuit in each eye, a distinct and sustained nystagmus at maximum deviation in each eye, 
and then an onset of nystagmus prior to 45 degrees. And what, if anything, did you observe in the defendant in regards to those six indicators? I did not notice any of those indicators in his eyes. We are back live in the Gaspar courtroom, so I'm going to take you straight back there. We'll hopefully be back with Matthew Adam Gray during the next break. Welcome back to Law News Network. I'm Heather Hansen here with Matthew Adam Gray, and we are talking about that argument. Uh, you know, most of the time these arguments are just a throwaway, something that lawyers have to do because they want to have something to appeal later. But this is an argument that the defense very well could win, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, they feel like it looks like the state is on the ropes a little bit. Yeah. I mean, they're really doing this very precise statutory construction, and then they're kind of jumping over each other. When I was a prosecutor, my argument was my own. Nobody was coming up and helping me out. I mean, it seems like they have to kind of assist each other and tag team, which kind of speaks to their desperation a little bit. Let's, let's unpack that a little bit, because first of all, the statutory reconstruction thing is the whole thing that we do in law school, and it was probably, it was my least favorite part of law school. Picking apart the statutes, I know our host Aaron Keller loves this stuff, and he's done a pretty thorough review of this case and this statute online, but he's picking apart, they're picking apart the judges, the statute to say, do these words modify these words, or do they modify these words? It seems pretty clear to me that the judge agrees with the defense that this case, the, the use of the methadone here, does not fall within the statute that defines impairment. Don't you think that that's ultimately what he's deciding here? It looks like he's leaning towards that. And yes, the defense, once again, has kept it simple and kind of drawn the court's attention to really the quick and it sounds like the right answer. I mean, right. is that really it's about the prescribed dose. I mean, how do you find someone impaired if they're taking the dose that's prescribed by their physician? Well, right. And, how, and if we start doing that, then how can we have not have the courts filled with people who are taking the medications and then you find out have they skipped two days because that's been a big issue on the prosecutor side. But another thing you pointed out, Matthew, that I think is important to point out is when I was first learning, I would go to court with my mentor and he would allow me to have some arguments. And I knew if he popped up during my argument, then things probably weren't going all that well. And that's what we just saw there, Correct. that she, that the, the female prosecutor was arguing and then the male stood up and sort of piped in and sort of a different argument. Does that show to you that they're a little bit concerned about this? Of course. I mean, yes, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of the fact that they're fighting so hard does speak to the fact that there is a possibility that they could have a directed verdict here. I mean, I, I think his argument was actually stronger when he stood up. It made a little more sense. But then she got back in and muddied the water. And when it comes to questions of fact and directed verdicts, my concern would be that sometimes the judge just gets confused and there's enough going on. They're like, you know what, let's let the jury, let the decide. jury decide. There's a question of fact, we'll let the jury decide. But who knows? I mean, he might come back and find he might dismiss some of those charges. And if he doesn't, there's a very strong appellate basis to appeal any sort of conviction on those counts. Because this is the type of law that everyone in Ohio and ultimately nationally is going to want to be clear, especially if we have increasing methadone clinics across the United States. You saw the, um, or we saw the body language of not only the defense attorney, but the defendant when they sort of, when the judge was sort of seeming to be agreeing with them, nodding their heads 
heads and almost jumping up for joy. Um, you know, that's the type of thing where you have to remember to keep your mouth shut and not push your luck. Right. So hopefully we'll get a we'll get a ruling pretty quickly. We do want to take you back live. The Segura trial is back again, and the DNA expert continues to be on the stand. In case we don't get Matthew Adam Gray back before he has to leave, I want to thank you for being with me for so long here today. We'll definitely have you back to help us pick apart these cases. But in the meantime, we want to take you back to the Segura case, and we'll be back as soon as Gaspar's live. Well, that was quick. Welcome back to Law News Network. I'm Heather Hansen, and here Matthew Adam Gray is still with me. And we just saw the little teeny bit of Segura, and they're done with the DNA witness, at least for today. In total, I mean, it was dry. Mm -hmm. It was um, sometimes painfully dry. But in total, who do you think she helped the most? I think overall she helped. She was a defense witness. I mean, there is no physical evidence, DNA, blood, anything whatsoever, fingerprint tying this defendant to the crime scene. Yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it, this case is such circumstantial evidence. And these are two cases where you see potential overcharging of, of defendants. And we'll see where both cases go. But I think juries are a whole lot smarter than we sometimes give them credit for. And uh, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, it appears as though in the the um, Segura case, they need to set up something for the next witness. And so hopefully it's not more of the same type of testimony, but it may well be because we hear a lot about forensics and gunshots and all of that type of um, sort of DNA TV type evidence that is a lot more dry than it is when we watch it on television. Right. I want to go back to talking about Gaspar because we may see a verdict as soon as today. I, I think if I remember correctly, the judge does put some limit on the amount of time that they can use for closings. How do you feel about that as an attorney, a trial attorney? I know a lot of times for me, judges will say closings can't be more than 30 minutes or an hour. Do you feel that that's appropriate or do you feel like as an attorney, you should have the right to argue as long as you feel necessary? I think it depends on the case. I mean, if they give me a reasonable amount of time, I think that that's sufficient. But if they're cutting you short and you're not able to hit every argument, I think it's problematic. Plus, there's a tendency to rush and try to speak more quickly, and then the jury's not really following every thing you're saying. I mean, I think in this case, he's recognizing that the arguments are what they are and that they shouldn't drone on and on and on for hours after hour. Especially if he cuts out that impairment count, that's, then that's it, right. it could well, really sort of shorten up the case in absolutely. total. Um, I want to continue to talk about Sergeant Gable's field sobriety test because that plus the statute is where the prosecutor gets the argument of impairment. And if the judge is arguing that the statute doesn't really apply, that plus this field sobriety test may not be enough to influence the jury either. So let's go to the next clip and look, watch a little bit more about the field sobriety test. Sure. Um, so the process begins with a breath test. So um, when a DRE becomes involved in the case, the first step in the protocol is a breath test. Um, second thing is an interview with the arresting officer. The third thing we do is take an initial pulse and, um, and talk with the person. Um, then we move into psychophysical tests. Um, then we move into vital signs, including blood pressure. I'm sorry, psychophysical tests. In including uh, the uh, modified Romberg balance test, the uh, walk and turn test, the one leg stand test, uh, where we have them stand on both their right and their left foot, um, and then the finger to nose test are all psychophysical tests that are included in the DRE protocol. Uh, then we move into vital signs, uh, which includes uh, blood pressure, a second pulse, and uh, body temperature. Um, then we move into um, observation of the eyes, um, which is um, in three different phases of light. So we measure pupils using a pupilometer in uh, room light, uh, near total darkness, and then direct light. Um, and then also during direct light, we're looking for um, um, the pupils to, uh, to pulse, basically. Um, and then uh, we move into injection signs, um, a third pulse, uh, muscle tone, um, and then move into toxicology and the, inter in the um, interview with the person, basically, at the end. Now, is there a national agency through which drug recognition and examination is recognized? Yes. Which agency is that? The International Association of Chiefs of Police. That's who... And in terms of 
drug recognition examination, were there additional tests you administered to this defendant? Yes. What were those physical tests that you administered to this defendant? The modified Romberg balance test and the finger to nose test. Can you explain the instructions you give for the modified Romberg balance test and the finger to nose test? Sure. So modified Romberg balance is basically a test where someone is to stand still with their head tilted back and their eyes closed and estimate the passage of 30 seconds. So that's really the instructions that you need to stand still, tilt your head back, close your eyes, and estimate the passage of 30 seconds. I tell them that I will start the time clock when I say begin or start, and they will end the time clock when they feel 30 seconds has passed. They need to bring their head forward, open their eyes, and say the word stop. And what instructions are given for the finger to nose test? In finger to nose, the person is to stand still and upright, hands down at their sides, make fists, and then point their fingers out so that their hands are down at their sides. And then I'm going to... For finger to nose, do you demonstrate to them what they should be doing when giving those instructions? Not necessarily through the test. No. What instructions are given? So the instructions are just to get them to initially stand with their hands and their pointer fingers pointed down at their sides. And then I tell them that I'm going to be giving them instructions, either left or right, and then whatever side I give them, I need them to bring that finger up and to touch the tip of their nose with the very tip of their finger, and then return that hand down to their side. I explain to them that it's really important that they touch the very tip of their nose, so then I kind of show them kind of a nose, and I say I don't want you to touch the underside of your nose or the sides of your nose or the bridge of your nose, but the actual tip of your nose, the very end of your nose. And when I say tip of your finger, I mean the actual tip where the finger meets the nail at the tip of your finger, not the pad of your finger or the sides of your finger, but the tip of your finger. So tip your finger to the tip of your nose. It's pretty important, so we spend some time going over that with them. What's the significance of that? Why do you say it's pretty important? Because I definitely don't want to leave any of it up to confusion. The judge's ruling in the Gaspar case, I'm going to take you straight there.